part of the nature of disease is determined by the distinction between organs and tissues that are either more vulnerable or more robust, and organs and tissues differ considerably in that respect. This has to do with tissue renewal and repair, sensitivity to stress, vulnerability to threats, which tissues are the weakest physiological links, and the fact that evolution has designed different tissues and organs to have different built-in safety factors. All of this occurs within a framework of trade-offs and constraints. It also occurs because trade-offs leave us exposed to mismatches which reveal the costs of the trade-offs. So let's consider this spectrum from, from vulnerability to robustness. Organs and tissues differ in their robustness, their resilience, and their vulnerability. Robustness means how resistant a system is to disease, and resilience means how easily a system can return to health. That mosaic determines the spectrum of diseases, both in general and in particular environments. Robustness and resilience are often negatively correlated. Bones, for example, resist damage, so they're robust, but they're hard to mend. On the other hand, epithelium wounds easily, but it recovers rapidly. So it's resilient, but it's not very robust. Now, why are all organs and tissues not as robust and resilient as possible? It's because of trade-offs. Producing such structures and processes would cost more than it would pay. Let's consider tissue renewal and repair. Here we have a picture of a bronchial ep epithelium and some neurons in the rat's spinal cord. These have different properties. Tissues that have a high renewal rate, like the bronchiolar epithelium, also have a high repair capacity, and they're pretty tolerant to damage. That's true of most epithelia and the hematopoietic system. On the other hand, tissues that have a low renewal rate and a low repair capacity do not tolerate damage. That includes neurons and cardiomyces. Damage to tissues with a high renewal rate is easily handled. Comparable damage to things like neurons and cardiomyces can be fatal. What about sensitivity to stress? Well, in tissues with high energetic demands, rely exclusively on oxidative metabolism. So that would be neurons and heart muscle. Tissues with low energetic demands tolerate hypoxia relatively well because they can switch from oxidative to glycolytic metabolisms. So that would be adipocytes, fibroblasts, hematopoietic cells. Now that's why ischemia, the lack of oxygen and nutrients, rapidly and seriously damages brains, hearts, and kidneys often irreversibly, sometimes fatally. So these are the tissues that really need oxygen and are prioritized by our circulatory system to keep them going when oxygen levels drop. Then there is vulnerability to threats. Protective structures have evolved to shield vulnerable organs from frequently encountered threats. So the skull protects the brain, the rib cage protects the heart and lungs. Some tissues and organs are immune privileged. Here we have pictures of a couple of them. They don't permit immune responses that have damaging side effects, inflammation, for example. So brain, eyes, and gonads are all immune privileged, and they do not inflame easily when infected. However, a price is paid, and the price is by avoiding the cost of inflammation, they make themselves vulnerable to pathogens that can get into them. So what are the weakest physiological links? The consequences of losing function vary widely among tissues and organs. If you have mild damage to liver, skin, or intestinal epithelium, that can be tolerated, repaired. It's often not lethal, uncomfortable, but not lethal. Equivalent damage to the pulmonary the cardiovascular or to the central nervous system causes severe disease and even death. So these are the weakest links in the body. Their malfunction kills and their failure is a frequent cause of death in the aged. 
It is therefore the weakest links where special features have evolved to protect against catastrophic failure. Built-in safety factors are part of those protections. The safety factor is the ratio of functional capacity to expected maximal load. So for example, if body weight is W and the skeleton can bear a weight of 4W, then the safety factor of the skeleton is 4. Increasing the safety factor has cost. In this case, further strengthening the skeleton would decrease mobility. That's a trade-off. The greater the safety factor, the greater the resistance to damage, but also the larger the costs of resistance. Here are a few safety factors for biological materials. Human pancreas, about 10. The wing bones of a flying goose, about 6. Human kidneys, about 4. The leg bones of a running ostrich, about 2.5. The human small intestine, about 2. And the backbone of a weightlifter, between 1 and 2. Our vulnerability is explained by trade-offs and constraints. Many structures are vulnerable because of compromises that are imposed by trade-offs. So for example, here is a synovial joint. The wrist, the elbow, the finger, the shoulder, and the knee are all synovial joints, and they have superior mobility, but they are vulnerable to arthritis. Alveolar sacs in our lungs have excellent gas exchange, but they are vulnerable to pneumonia when they're filled with inflammatory exudate. So you can see that there are vulnerabilities and costs that are built into things which otherwise are highly adaptive. Other structures are vulnerable because of historical constraints. One of the classic ones is the blind spot in the vertebrate eye. Here is a vertebrate eye contrasted with an octopus eye. The red is the retina, the photosensitive cells. The octopus has the retina lining the cup of the eye with the nerve fibers behind it. The vertebrate eye has the nerve fibers lining the cup of the eye with the retina behind it, and the nerve fibers have to go through the retina at some point to get to the brain, and that is the blind spot. This difference in the structure of the eyes has persisted for about 500 million years and probably has to do with the developmental constraint on the relationship of inducing tissues. Trade-offs, we've mentioned many times, they're very important. After sufficient evolution in a stable environment, the cost-benefit balance of a trade-off has usually been optimized. However, sufficient evolution in a stable environment is actually a very special case. Effects of disturbance can be serious when the trade-off involves large benefits that are balanced by large costs. Pathologies can then result for two reasons. The mechanism controlling the balance of the trade-off are perturbed or the environment changes. For example, the immune defense against infection is a large benefit. It brings with it, however, high costs of immunopathology and the risks of sepsis, anaphylactic shock, and autoimmune disease. The clotting system is a very large benefit, which helps us to heal rapidly if we sustain damage to our circulatory system, but it carries the risk of embolism and stroke. Mismatch, also an important concept frequently mentioned. If the environment changes, the cost may exceed the benefits until evolution catches up, and that can take quite a while. Modern hygienic environments are abnormal. They elicit pathological immune responses that include asthma, allergies, eczema, and autoimmune diseases. Here is an example of eczema on the forearms of a patient. Changes in diet and in inflammation increase the risk of clotting disorders. So to summarize, the morphology and physiology of the patient is a mosaic of tissues, organs, processes, and structures that vary in their vulnerability to damage, their capacity for repair, their sensitivity to stress, and their built-in safety factors. The key idea here is trade-offs. Each of these features has benefits and costs. When perturbations shift the cost-benefit balance, they elicit pathologies, that is, situations in which the costs are greater than the benefits.